All right, welcome back again. Uh, oops, shoot, sorry. We're here for our section on federalism, separation of powers, uh, and civil rights and civil liberties. Um, a lot of what's in chapter three of Lowy, we have danced around already, so, uh, and will be things we come back to again and again. So I'm not gonna, try not to dwell any more than I need to on things that we've already discussed and things that are gonna come up again. So the first part of the slides here, I'm gonna probably go a bit faster so I can spend more time on um, the back end on civil rights and civil civil liberties. Because we know we already know that federalism divides power into two levels, right? Federal and state. And we've talked a little bit about separation of powers, how we divide each level of government against itself, then the separation of powers leads to checks and balances, and how we think that's a pretty good thing. Um, these institutional features limit the power of government and make policymaking harder uh, by dispersing power and making collective action difficult, right? The 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 system was set up so that the government couldn't just do what it wanted willy-nilly. Um, however, it can cause problems between what the federal government want, might want and what state and local governments might want, right? And we'll talk about how the Constitution, we already have talked a bit about how the Constitution um, expressly says, hey, the federal government can do this and states government, state governments can do that. But uh, there are things like, say, immigration laws that are set by the federal government. Uh, and when those policies don't quite go to plan, uh, and let's say you've got undocumented people who live in places within states and, and, and municipal governments, um, they might not, the, the, the different governments might, might not agree on, on how to implement law and whose responsibility it is to do so. And that is stressed uh, by uh, the question of sanctuary cities, right? Uh, where undocumented migrants uh, can be shielded from federal efforts to detain them and deport them, right? So if a, if a state or local government doesn't want to work with the federal government to deport people, what happens, right? Um, so federalism is a good thing, we think, because it can uh, put the brakes on making uh, policy willy-nilly and uh, you know it prevents the, 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 the tyranny of the majority. Uh, but sometimes it can cause some friction. And I've got some other examples I'll come back to. Um, but we know that federalism is the division of powers and functions between federal and state governments, right? And the constitution provides express powers and implied powers to the federal government. The 10th amendment, I already mentioned this uh, once in the semester, reserves the rest of governmental powers for the states, right? The constitution is meant to be pretty clear about this. Um, state powers include reserved powers, these are powers not specifically delegated to the federal government or denied to the states under the Constitution. These are things like criminal codes, health and safety rules, family law, professional licensure, etc. Right? Uh, if you want to be a dentist, there's no federal government that you go to to get your dentist license, right? If you're a if you're a dentist in Cleveland, well, then the state of Ohio is going to issue your dental license, right? Uh, most criminal codes, most criminal laws uh, are violated and prosecuted at the state level. We'll talk about that when we get to uh, the court section. Um, but uh, there there are federal criminal codes, of course. But uh, most criminal law, most family law, these things are handled by states. We can talk of concurrent powers which is authority uh, possessed by both state and federal governments. And that unfortunately is the power to levy taxes, right? So um, in the state of California, you work, you pay your taxes, you pay income tax to the federal government and you pay federal tax to uh, the state government. I now live in Texas and there is no state income tax, which is fine by me. Um, state obligations to each other. The constitution has what's called a full faith and credit clause. Um, which uh, is described here in page 56 of the 16th edition. Um, but states are supposed to recognize actions and decisions taken in other states as legal and proper, right? So you get married in one state and you're married uh, if you move to a different one. Um, you have a driver's license from one state, it's valid in another one, right? So uh, that's meant to be a pretty good thing. Uh, the comedy clause, not comedy, haha, but com comedy, uh, is the clause that uh, states that a state cannot discriminate against someone from another state or give special privileges to its own residents. Um, there are, someone once asked me about like 
public universities. I mean, isn't that a violation of the comedy clause? And I asked someone in the politics department who knows more about the U.S. Constitution than I do. And uh, yeah, she gave me a long answer that I didn't really understand. But uh, there are ways around this. But like, you can't be, for example, uh, one of the things she did say is like, you can't be uh, punished more harshly for a criminal violation uh, in California because you're from Utah as opposed to what a Californian would receive, right? So that's what uh, that's what's meant by this. Uh, what about local government, Larson? Well, local governments are not granted any power in the Constitution, whether that's counties, cities, towns, nothing. So um, that is all created by state legislatures and state constitutions. Uh, I think all 50 states have their own constitution. I'm not I, I don't know if I would bet on that or not, but I know most states do, uh, and all states have some form of legislature that, that sets up the rules. So, um, And many states have given, if not most states, have given larger cities in their states home rule or a, a guarantee of non-interference in local affairs. Um, although sanctuary cities, the debate over the minimum wage, even uh, the debate over you know, using a mask uh, is putting some of this to, to the test. Um, I've, I find it funny uh, now that I'm in Texas and the pandemic is still going on um, that, um, you know, Texas is one of these states that likes to scream states rights about everything. Federal government can't tell us what to do. But the state of Texas um, is uh, doing its best to tell uh, local governments, uh, municipal, city, town governments uh, what to do and what not to do. Uh, and mainly that's to not impose a mask mandate. So, you know, go figure. Uh, rules, I guess, are meant to be broken by Texas. Um, a little bit of history here, the history of federalism. I'm going to go over this quickly. I'm not going to ask you. Uh, I don't think I ask you about anything involving dates, uh, years on the, on, on the exam. But um, we could talk early on in the, after the founding of dual federalism, where powers were shared by the, the federal and local governments. Um, the Commerce Clause uh, is in the Constitution. Uh, it's a pretty important source of federal power, and it states that Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign states and among the several states and with Indian tribes. Um, this means that uh, if anything crosses state boundaries or has to do with, with a Native American tribe, uh, then Congress has the power to regulate it. Um, so that means, you know, if, you, if you're talking about a business transaction between a, a an entity in um, Arizona and another in New Mexico, well, then federal law is going to apply to that transaction, right? That's because of the Commerce Clause. Um, but it's an important source of congressional power. Um, early Supreme Court rulings tended to expand the potential of federal power. Um, we've shifted gears a bit since. Um, after or upon the time of the Great Depression, this is the, the FDR years, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president, a big expansion of the federal government. Um, and there were supportive relations or partners, partnerships between federal government and state and local governments. Uh, we saw a lot of use of what's called uh, grants in aid uh, to state and local governments. Um, this is, uh, these are funds given by Congress to state and local governments to be spent on a particular purpose. Um, like education, crime prevention, housing, etc. This is the federal government providing a carrot to the states to get states to do what the federal government wanted. So uh, it's like money with strings attached. Um, if you're following along in the text, uh, at least in the six. The 16th edition of the text, it's pages 64 and 65. Um, this is on page 65. Um, if you've got the 15th edition, there's no projection, I don't think, out to, two, uh, to 2020. But um, this uh, grant in aid uh, still goes on uh, and it has expanded dramatically. I mean, again, it's a way to, for the federal government to get states to do what the federal government wants states to do. Um, and here you can see that uh, uh, federal aid has been very important uh, historically, and this is since 1960 to 2020. Uh, the orange line here is federal aid is a, as a percentage of state and local budgets, right? So nearly a third of any state, any randomly chosen state or local budget is going to uh, be paid for by uh, federal money, right? Um, so there we are. I mean, there's, there's a the states in, in the United States can't escape the influence of the of the federal government, whether they like it or not. Uh, we can talk about regulated federalism, which is the 60s to the 90s, um, where federal the federal government uh, dictated national standards uh, that states must meet or rules they have to follow or lose grant money. 
Um, a good example of this is the federal highway funding and the drinking age. Uh, you might ask, you know, why is there a federal law that says you have to be 21 to drink in the United States? No, there's not. No, there's not. Uh, but all 50 states have that as the law that you have to be 21 to drink in the United States. And that is because if a state lowers the drinking age to under 21, that state will lose its federal highway funding. So this was uh, a way for the federal government to say, hey, we want this to be the law of the land, but we know we can't legislate this from Washington. So we'll just attach a bunch of strings to it. So that's why the drinking age is 21 in the United States, and it is not a federal law. But again, if states uh, reduce the drinking age, then that given state would lose its federal highway funding. Um, this period saw a rise in unfunded mandates, which were national standards and programs imposed on state and local governments without funding. Uh, this often uh, annoys states to no end. The Civil Rights Act, uh, Civil Rights Acts of 57 and 64, the Voting Rights Act, were laws passed at the federal level changing the rules for states, but without any funding provided to make those changes. You can imagine that these three particular acts did a good job of, um, uh, I believe the technical term is pissing off, aggravating, we'll say, uh, the southern states, right? Like, how dare you change these laws and not provide us any money to facilitate the changes? Another example uh, would be back, there was an oil crisis even before Larson was born. <gasps> In 1973, there was a global oil crisis the price of oil shot up. Uh, the United States was producing oil, but not as much as it does now. Uh, and the federal government uh, insisted that the speed limit across the country be reduced to 55 miles an hour. Because the slower you go, the more efficient uh, your tank of gas is. You can go further, the slower you go. Uh, and so to reduce dependence on uh, gasoline at the time in the early 70s, the federal government insisted that uh, the speed limit be dropped. Uh, and that was overturned in, I think, 1995. And now in Texas, there are uh, places you can go 85 legally uh, down the highway. Um, so anyway, uh, last period to discuss is this uh, period of new federalism, which really kicked off in uh, 1994. Uh, there was a, a big shift in the U.S. House of Representatives. The Republicans took over after a long time of being the minority party in the House. Uh, and they were really keen on... Uh, crafting federal policies to return more discretion and power to the states. Um, the notion of unfunded mandates uh, was made illegal by federal law. Um, and instead of doing these grants in, uh, um, grants in aid, uh, we've seen a, a rise of the use of block grants, which have fewer federal restrictions. It's basically just a pot, a pot of money that a, the federal government gives to a state or local government to, to, do with as it may without nearly the strings attached uh, as a grant in aid. Um, there have been efforts by the courts to interpret the Interstate Commerce Clause more narrowly uh, to maybe limit uh, what the federal government can um, dictate to the states, right? Remember that Commerce Clause is a big source of federal power. Um, here is a rather simplistic, uh, I think simplistic, but maybe useful uh, figure. It's on page 66 of the new newest edition of the textbook. Uh, we can view federalism as, as a dual federalism layer cake with the national government on top of state governments, uh, or we can view it as a marble cake where there's a lot more overlap. I think that's really more uh, the reality where we see some cooperation uh, between federal and, and local governments, state local governments. Uh, think about checks and balances. And again, we've talked about this already. We've talked around this uh, before, uh, but it bears repeating. The Constitution establishes mechanisms through which each branch of government uh, can participate in and influence the activities of others. I mean, there's really no, we use the term separation of powers, uh, but in practice, there really is no strict separation. Just about anything that one um, branch of government does is at the very least going to influence one of the other two. So, but in practice, each branch has its own agenda and veto power that, that will require cooperation among the three branches to get things done. Um, here is uh, another little figure. This would be uh, on page 74 of the 16th edition. I'm not going to read this to you. Uh, you can read it yourself, but it explains in greater detail a lot of what I've already, has already come up with 
uh, in in previous lectures, right, about um, executive appointments and, and legislative approval and, and judicial review and things like that. So uh, do have a look at this. Maybe have this um, this figure handy uh, come uh, quiz or, or test time because uh, this is all useful stuff, but you can read this and uh, we've talked around a lot of this already. Um, issue of legislative supremacy. Uh, remember, Congress is is laid out in the first article of the Constitution. It's really meant to be um, the most powerful branch. The Constitution did not create separate but equal branches of government. The legislative branch, again, was expected to be the most powerful. Um, you know, branches are given the power to defend themselves against encroachments from others. Um, but uh, in practice, you know, it's 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 a it's it's not conflictual isn't the right word, but uh, the relationship between the the branches through checks and balances is one that uh, well we're we're going to talk about here in the coming weeks in in with a lot more examples. Um, divided government is a term that I hope you've heard before. Um, this is when the presidency is controlled by one party while the opposing party controls one or both houses of Congress. So um, you know when. Uh, after the midterm elections in 2018, um, the Republicans lost control of the House of Representatives, uh, which had been controlled by well, been controlled by the party of the president. President Trump was in office, and the Republicans, his first two years, controlled the House and the Senate, and that's unified government. Um, but uh, divided government is when the presidency and one of two houses of Congress are not under the same. Uh, political party. So President Trump had unified government for the first two years of his first term and then divided government with the Democratic control of the House. Biden also has unified government for the first two years, uh, at least thus far, um, but that's that's barely as there's a 50-50 split in the Senate and ties are broken by uh, the vice president, in this case, Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, is worth pointing out that m most, if not well, we'll say most incoming presidents often enjoy unified government when they start out. Um, most presidents uh, see their party lose control or lose seats in, in Congress, both in the House and the Senate, uh, come the midterms. So we'll see uh, what the future holds. But uh, the role of the Supreme Court, the other branch of government here, has evolved over time. We've talked about judicial review superficially. We'll talk about it in greater detail when we talk specifically about the court system. But judicial review is the court's ability to strike down presidential actions or laws passed by Congress. Uh, it's used very sparingly for most of U.S. history, but we've seen a lot more of it in recent years. I think this has a lot to do with the politicization of the judicial branch of government. Um, uh, right there. So I skipped over some of chapter three. I hit, hit you with the high points, um, but there we are. Let's shift to chapter four. If you want to pause and step away, this might be a good time to do so. Um, but uh, here we are talking about civil rights and civil liberties, right? We talked earlier uh, in the semester about this trade-off between um, you know, freedom and security, and this is, this, is, uh, this is the theoretical end of things here. Um, worth mentioning that civil liberties and civil rights are not the same. Civil liberties, right? Liberty, freedom, these are protections of citizens from improper governmental action, okay? What the government must not do. These are your liberties. Civil rights are the legal or moral claims that you are entitled to make on the government. So this is how the government must treat you or what the government must allow you to do. So one, uh, you know, the, the the idea is the same, and that's why we talk about civil liberties and rights in the same chapter, but uh, the words in practice are uh, not identical here. Um, but together we can talk of these as the social contract between citizens and government, right? What, what, what each of us as citizens and our government uh, are, you know, what are our roles? What are our responsibilities? What are our rights and what are our freedoms, right? Um, the notion of civil liberties goes back to the Bill of Rights, which I've talked about already. Um, remember that to get the constitution ratified, the Federalists had to pledge to amend the constitution by adding a Bill of Rights. And that's because the anti-federalists were worried about the power of the federal government. So the Bill of Rights was adopted by late uh, 1791. And the 10 amendments that now make up the Bill of Rights include both substantive and procedural restraints on government power. Right. Uh, the government shall not, uh, you know, 
pass a law that uh, prevents us from uh, keeping arms, right? Uh, here you see the, the summary uh, as is. Uh, this is on page 84 of uh, the 16th edition. If you want to consult this, I'm not going to read through right now, but it's a good little summary uh, of the Bill of Rights. So uh, we can talk about civil rights and liberties revolution. Fast forward, you know, nearly 200 years. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education, the famous Supreme Court decision that uh, was meant to end segregation in public schooling, really expanded the scope of civil rights and liberties. Uh, and the court, because this was decided, you know, this is a Supreme Court decision that, that employed the use of strict scrutiny, which is the most stringent standard of judicial review of a government's actions. Uh, the court decided uh, that the government must show that a given law serves a compelling state interest uh, for that law to be legal and constitutional. And the Supreme Court had decided that there was no compelling state interest to segregate public schools. So this was a key turning point both in the civil rights movement, but it also was indicative of, a, of an increasingly active role for the judici judiciary system, right? in particular the Supreme Court. Um, civil rights here are, again, the rules that governments must follow about how they treat people when collective decisions are being made. So who has a right and who does not, right? And that usually starts with, are you a citizen or are you not? All citizens in any given country uh, have more rights than non-citizens. And I've been a non-citizen living in a lot of different places. Um, and the most basic example would be voting, right? It's not that governments have a right to treat non-citizens horribly or anything like that, although we can see examples of that. Uh, we don't have to look too far from home uh, to find examples, but, um, you know, obviously, uh, if I'm a U.S. citizen, I can vote and my spouse is not a U.S. citizen. Well, she can't vote. Right. A right to what? Is that voting? Is that uh, the right to bear arms? Uh, what is it? Right. Uh, these are things to keep in mind. How much can the individual exercise that right? Right. I have a right to free speech, but I can't scream fire in a crowded but socially distanced uh, theater. Right. Um, so there are, there can be limits to what rights uh to our to the exercise of our rights, we'll put it that way. Um, key question to ask is: Does the government treat everyone equally? Uh, and maybe a better question to ask here is: What are the consequences since the answer is no? Right? We know that the government doesn't treat everyone equally uh, in the United States, and likely in lots of other countries too. Uh, especially even even good democracies. This hyperlink here will take you to uh, about a twenty minute uh, monologue by Trevor Noah. Uh, of The Daily Show fame, uh, recorded from his apartment uh, during the pandemic shortly after the uh, murder of George Floyd. Uh, and it's really good. It's powerful. Um, it's worth your time. Uh, I watched it several times when it first aired. Uh, watched it with my wife, who's, again, not a U.S. citizen. She's lived here for a few years, but she's still learning her way around. And uh, she found it pretty useful uh, as well. So take, take some time. You know, If you want to pause this, Go back to the Canvas module, watch this uh, link. Uh, please, please watch it. Uh, you watch it now, watch it later. Um, voting rights, an example used in chapter four of uh, the Lowy text. Uh, we've talked a bit about this already uh, in Katz Nelson, so I'll, I'll go quickly through this here. But there's a long history in the United States of restricting the vote by religion, property, wealth, gender, race, and ethnicity, right? Initially, only um, white men who owned property uh, of a certain age could vote, right? And that has ex that has changed over time uh, for the better, right? The 15th Amendment officially gave African Americans voting rights after the uh, end of the Civil War, uh, after Reconstruction, so again, this post-Civil War period, the South then decided to adopt practices to keep blacks from voting, which included uh, all white primaries, which you know, only white candidates, only whites could vote, and primaries are handled by the parties, so go figure. Uh, poll taxes, some states and local um, and localities would require that uh, to vote you pay a tax, so that of course is a hurdle for poor. The poor you are, the less likely you are to vote. It still is the case today, but not because of poll taxes. Um, there used to be literally literacy tests that were imposed. Uh, and then, of course, redistrict, redistricting the, the redrawing of boundaries um, of U.S. House districts and, and districts within states uh, doesn't necessarily keep people from voting, but it might limit uh, the, the African-American vote uh, 
uh, within a district, right? Uh, we'll talk more about this when the time comes, about redistricting, when we get to uh, uh, the Congress section. But anyway, women's suffrage as well. Uh, the United States adopted restrictions on, on women owning property and thus voting from Britain. Uh, the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 first called for um, uh, declaration of rights and sentiments and thus equal rights for women and men. We're still not there. Um, the NWSA, uh, National Women's Suffrage Association, pushed the issue of women's voting rights through mass meetings, parades, and protests. And then uh, by 1920, uh, right, just over 100 years ago, women finally got the right to vote in the United States. Um, there are other countries like Switzerland. I don't think women got the total right to vote until the early 70s. Amazing. Um, I mean, yeah, crazy. But anyway, um, how about protecting African-Americans' right to vote? The Supreme Court decisions uh, struck down white, the white primaries and unfair districting practices, which actually still goes on. Um, Congress adopted voting, the Voting Rights Act of, of 1965, which meant to abolish poll taxes and literacy tests. But restricting, uh, redistricting and voter ID laws continue uh, today, and the fight over minority voting rights carries on, right? Uh, we're seeing this uh, right now uh, with concern over mail-in voting uh, and the pandemic, right? Particularly after the 2020 election, uh, many of our Republican friends in particular uh, were very upset that uh, the, the mail-in voting was so high in several in different states um, and somehow that was bad for them. I mean, I guess really when more people vote, uh, Republicans tend to not do so well um, is my take on things. But, you know, I mean, we can be concerned about the pandemic. Uh, and I mean, maybe that's a reason to facilitate mail-in voting so people don't have to go out. But um, anyway, uh, we're seeing this with, I mean, even before the pandemic, voter ID laws were uh, a real debate, continue to be uh, among different states where what type of ID uh, do you have to have to be able to vote, right? Um, and making it more complicated has an adverse effect, uh, particularly on um, people of color when they try to vote. Um, going back in history a bit, uh, a quick note on Plessy versus Ferguson, which uh, instigated this separate but equal doctrine, um, which began in, in Louisiana uh, that required segregation of races on trolleys and other public car carriers and by implication, all public facilities, including school. Uh, as long as uh, everything was equal, in quotes, uh, they could be separate, right? Uh, the doctrine, that accommodations could be segregated by race, but still be equal. Um, this was then shot down. This was at the crux of Brown versus Board of Education. I'm circling back here. Um, but uh, the court became more active in equal protection by the 1930s. Uh, Linda Brown was an African-American child in my home state of Topeka, Kansas, who was denied admission to an all white school closer to her home. And the court then decided that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place, right? There was no compelling government interest to use the term that came up uh, earlier. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, right? And that's what the court decided. Problems with Brown's effects was that there was a delay in enforcing Brown by local officials. And, and this comes up, that's why I put these two chapters together, because this is a classic example of the problem of federalism. You have a federal court uh, that says, hey, you can't do this. And then state and local governments saying, yeah, try me, right? So Brown only attacked de jure segregation, which is legal segregation, but it could do little about de facto segregation, which is segregation in practice, right? De jure means legal, de facto in practice is Latin. Um, Brown did not directly address discrimination in employment, voting, and so on, but at the very least, this really was uh, you know, the start of uh, a real trend that uh, I think has been beneficial to um, the country ever since, right? The irony of Brown is that it gave great moral capital to the Supreme Court, but didn't change things much on the ground, at least initially, right? Um, but it did really kick off the civil rights movement, right? Which was massive collective political action to demand that the civil rights of whites enjoyed, uh, that whites enjoyed be extended to African-Americans, right? Civil rights organizations built networks, uh, across the South and, and around the country, organized protests, used the power of media to draw attention to civil rights uh, and use the court system as well. And we can see uh, today's Black Lives Matter movement 
uh, really uh, as an extension of this, right? I mean, I don't think we would have Black Lives Matter as we do today without the progress made uh, by the civil rights movement uh, going back to the 50s uh, and into the 70s, right? Um, talk about other forms of uh, rights and liberties, opportunity education. This is a building from the discussion of, of Brown. Uh, there was massive resistance to desegregation from Southern governments. I don't mean to pick on the South, but it's easy to do. Uh, federal courts struck down tactics to avoid integration and Presidents Eisenhower, a Republican, and Kennedy, a Democrat, ordered federal troops in the 50s and 60s to Southern schools and universities to support these orders. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 expanded the federal power to outlaw discrimination. Uh, if we think about women in education, Title IX, which I'm sure you've all heard the term, hopefully you know what it's about, of the 1972 Education Act forbids gender discrimination in education. Uh, and it's been used uh, in the court system to address unequal treatment of men's and women's sports in particular, uh, as well as failure of school authorities to enforce policies related to sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, so again, this is uh, federal, federal law here. Uh, discrimination in employment. <clears throat> Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlaws job discrimination by all employers, public and private, uh, and Title uh, VII fostered growth of, of, uh, women's of the women's movement. Uh, civil rights for women ex uh, accelerated in the 1960s, again, um, mirroring uh, the playbook and success of the civil rights movement for African Americans that began prior. Uh, if we want to talk about Latinos and Asian Americans, um, or Latin X's, uh, I don't know, in Spain, the arroba here is, is what I often use um, to try to degender the, the term Latino. Um, but uh, and Asian Americans are among the fastest growing racial and ethnic groups in the United States. As a matter of fact, since the economic crisis of 2009, uh, more Asians have migrated to the United States than uh, anyone from Latin America. Side note. Uh, but these groups have organized, also organized to pursue civil rights. Um, the Mendez versus Westminster case of 1974 was an important desegregation precedent in California prior to Brown. Uh, Lau versus Nichols of 1974 uh, required education that students can understand. So this was a Supreme Court decision that triggered uh, uh, a legal need for uh, multilingual education, uh, which, again, I don't think is a bad thing. Thinking about immigration and rights, the Supreme Court has ruled that undocumented immigrants are eligible for education and medical care, but they can be denied other social benefits. Like I said earlier, uh, when we're talking about rights, um, citizens in any given country, and this is not meant to discriminate, but you know, if you're a citizen of a country, you're going to have more rights than a non-citizen in that same country. Even as democratic as it is, there are going to be limits to uh, what any migrant uh, can uh, demand of the state. Uh, but immigration reform remains an unresolved and very controversial issue. We know this, uh, arguably the most significant civil rights issue of the 2016 election campaign was the cause of government shutdowns under the Trump administration of 2018 and 19. Um, it was, uh, I, I don't know, uh, the drum to beat for some in the 2020 presidential campaign. Um, but uh, I think overshadowed by by the pandemic, despite uh, four years of the Trump administration's uh, actions against migrants. But um, Americans with disabilities, similar to the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, the disability movement uh, founded the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund. Uh, and its greatest achievement was the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, which guarantees equal employment rights and access to businesses for um the disabled, uh, my former senator, uh, now retired and, and got to be close to checking out Bob Dole. Uh, he uh, was disabled in, in the Second World War and very much fought uh, for this act uh, throughout his Senate career up to 1990. Uh, LGBTQ rights, um, perhaps the, the, the biggest flashpoint today. Uh, gay rights movement, one of the most important contemporary flashpoints for civil rights. Um, Court decision in 1996, Romer versus Evans prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, Lawrence versus Texas overturned Bowers versus Hardwick. Uh, without going into great detail, uh, Lawrence versus Texas basically made it illegal for states to uh, criminalize sodomy. Um, so there we are. Um, don't ask, don't tell, which you're probably too young to be terribly familiar with. 
was a uh, President Clinton initiative that was to allow uh, anyone uh, who's gay to serve in the military as long as they didn't tell anyone. Uh, this was uh, at the time in the 90s viewed as, as really progressive. And then um, like a lot of things over time, we see how foolish this idea was. It was repealed by the uh, Obama administration in 2010. So now um, uh, anybody, uh, you know, regardless of sexual orientation can serve in, in the military. However, transgender equality is hands down the most important uh, current uh, fight at present when we're talking about rights. Uh, Same-sex marriage, <clears throat> which uh, you know, 10 years ago was was very much undecided and a hot topic. Um, a case of federalism, you know, what would happen if, if a couple got married in Massachusetts or Iowa, uh, two of the first states to legalize uh, same-sex marriage, and then you move to, uh, I don't know, you know, Arkansas, uh, and then Arkansas doesn't want to recognize your marriage. Well, that's, that's not going to work, right? Um, because of the comedy clause. Um, uh, but anyway, U.S. versus Windsor in 2013 uh, ruled that the Defense of Marriage Act, which we call DOMA, D-O-M-A, uh, was unconstitutional. DOMA provided a federal definition of marriage as one man and one woman. And that was also done under the Clinton administration as um, a way to placate Republican concerns in the face of don't ask, don't tell. Um, the woman behind the Windsor decision, and that's why there's a hyperlink here, she re recently passed away a few years ago. Um, Worth listening to the story. Um, two women who are married, uh, the one spouse dies and the other tries to claim benefits and she was denied that under the Defense of Marriage Act and the Supreme Court then in 2013 ruled uh, DOMA unconstitutional. After that then, that paved the way for Obergfell versus Hodges of 2015, which ruled that there is a right to marry for same-sex couples under the Due Process Clause and Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, so that was when the Supreme Court settled the debate on same-sex marriage. And now um, anyone can get married anywhere in the United States. Uh, I'm down to my last couple of slides here, so I've gone on maybe a hair longer than I wanted to. Um, but affirmative action <clears throat> uh, is a policy or program designed to redress historic injustices committed against specific groups uh, by making special efforts to provide members of these groups with access to educational employment opportunities. Um, also meant to encourage diversity in educational employment settings. We know that there are many sectors, um, you know, banking, healthcare, at least in, in, in higher positions where diversity is, is still not, not there. But uh, affirmative action uh, is meant to uh, reduce, uh, we'll say, homogeneity, which is to say, you know, um, white male, um, those who are white and male holding positions up and down, uh, whatever um, industry, company, sector we, we'd be talking about. Uh, affirmative action is criticized for being uh, preferential treatment uh, for those who are non-white. Uh, and before you pat yourself on the back and say, California is such a wonderful progressive place, uh, I will remind you that in 1996, and I realize this might be before you were born, but that doesn't make it irrelevant, uh, Proposition 209 of that year sought to ban preferential treatment for minorities by state and local government agencies, and it passed with 54% of the vote, right? So things can change. But California wasn't always as progressive as you might think it is today. Uh, Houston, which is the the fourth, third, or fourth largest city in the United States, um, and the most diverse city. It's it surpassed um, New York as the most diverse city, diverse city in the United States. Uh, in 1997, voted 55 percent to support affirmative action. Texas, Texas was ahead of California there. So you know, history matters, facts matter, but keep this in mind. Uh, what else matters is what we call affirmative action. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, tends to support affirmative action, but um, has always danced around the issue of quotas. There have been recent decisions, uh, very uh, weak and watered down decisions having to do with uh, college admissions um, that have been challenged, uh, you know, policies that are meant to increase diversity, but uh, to whose expense. And it's often uh, some white person complaining that they didn't get into the university of so-and-so um, because they were white, which is kind of silly. But anyway, uh, there we are. That's, that's it for federalism and rights and liberties. My throat's dry. Uh, I'm done. Take care. Uh, we'll be in touch.